Okay. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, I'm extremely happy uh, to be here. Uh, just a brief introduction of myself. Uh, I originally came from Japan um, to Michigan for graduate training. Uh, and back then, uh, cognitive science was at the height, uh, which, the, which means that all the human minds are supposed to be like a computer, Mac computer or IBM, or whatever. Uh, meaning that uh, your internal processor whatever that is, some machinery of information processing got to be universal. So asking a cross-cultural question was OK, for sure. But if you're doing it, you are almost showing that you are dumb. Because you know, if internal processor, whatever that is, is universal, what's the point? of even beginning to examine cultural variation, you know, just leave it to somebody who have time or who don't have talent, <laughs> or maybe both. If you're a real social you know, psychologist with some credibility or talent, you really have to investigate the core processing machine. So that was the ideology of the field. Now, field has changed uh, quite a bit. Uh, and I'm one of those people who really began using uh, a method of experimental psychology in trying to demonstrate how, de how, how deep uh, culture might go under the skin, so to speak. So we wanted to see exactly how much psychological processes uh, might be influenced in some systematic way, depending on culture. Uh, and again, toward the end, I try to explain what I mean by culture. And that phase continued maybe for 10, 20 years. And lots of people outside of this small circle of psychologists using experimental method to investigate group differences say that all oh, this research kind of interesting, but didn't you know uh, all those things? Uh, that was the first reaction. And two, the whole approach uh, was a kind of static and descriptive, just uh, uh, you know, describing group differences. Uh, however, well, first of all, uh, well, field didn't know that those differences exist <laughs> surely before we started. And second, science really needs to start uh, with description. So, well, this said, uh, in the recent years, maybe in 10 years or so, uh, lots of people began investigating why those group differences might exist. And, uh, and uh, so that's one theme. And here, ecology proved to be extremely important. And Carol's uh, talk really resonates uh, what I'm going to say. And two, uh, basically, this question of embrainment uh, uh, in the neuroscience, basically. How, well, original question uh, was how deep uh, culture might go. And back then, there was no neuroscience, uh, simply because fMRI uh, and all those stuff uh, in neuroscience were not easily uh, available. But time has changed. And now it's relatively easy to use some cutting edge uh, neuroscience method. So now you can ask this question with the neuroscience method, how deeply uh, culture might go under the skin. And that's embrainment. And uh, well, I was just amazed how, how much parallel I, my talk is going to have with, uh, with Carol's presentation. Because one more theme I want to emphasize is em embodiment. So basically, you know, culture can influence your brain in some, in some dramatic way, far more dramatic than you imagined before, surely before my PhD, which was a long time ago. Uh, but, but also, culture seems to influence immune system and all the other stuff uh, in the body. And so today, I'm going to discuss uh, the first two themes, ecology and environment, in the first hour. And then in the second hour, I try to do a bit on embodiment. All right, so 
ecology, culture, and the brain. And here's uh, what I want to discuss. So in very early years in cultural psychology, when I, well, I basically finished my PhD in 1987, you know, cognitive psychology was still very strong. Neuroscience had not st uh, yet come yet. And I'm a social psychologist by training. And the entire field of social psychology was dominated by social cognition. So you, know, you really have to understand the cognitive machineries which are brought to bear uh, in the processing of social stimuli like race or gender, things like those. Uh, at the time, we began investigating group differences, as I mentioned to you, uh, focusing on East and West. And there's a lot of political, um, I mean, uh, well, East and West. Uh, the, the, you could say distinction itself is political. But just the choice of the topic is both political and economic. Simply, you know, psychology was almost 80% made in USA, 98% uh, uh, made in weird cu culture, uh, Western civilization. Uh, and uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, you know, only in Asia, people began interested in psychology. You know, just you have to feed yourself well enough before worrying about mental health. Uh, that's exactly what happened in Asia. So psychology became a thing to do at the university, for example. So lots of data came in. And the one thing that happened is that many things which are demonstrated, presumably with some robustness, do not happen easily in those Asian countries. And of course, Asians are modest, right? Uh, everybody knows that. And initially, we kind of believe that, oh, that's, that's not happening because Asians are kind of, uh, they are doing wrong thing. They didn't do what they are supposed to be doing. This whole thing changed dramatically, at least in my mind, when I went to University of Michigan and witnessed what was going on. You know, just the way in which studies are done was just as good in Japan, you know, back then, as how things are at the University of Michigan. So that cannot be the explanation. And that's the very beginning of raising the possibility that there might be something deeper, more profound in the failure to replicate some of the findings in Asian cultural context. Now, since then, uh, we proposed this distinction uh, between independent and interdependent self. And, well, you can accuse this of, say, of being simplistic. But the thing is that you really have to start with something simple. Otherwise, uh, you'll be overwhelmed. Uh, and uh, almost uh, uh, since then, uh, lots of elaboration, lots of qualifications, lots of underlining processes. However, I think uh, some description needs to come first. And this distinction is not that bad, in my opinion, and we'll see. So we argue that in Western civilization, uh, Western part of Europe, as well as basically uh, uh, where Anglo saxophones went uh, through immigration, uh, United States, Canada, um, South Africa, Australia, and so on, uh, there's a strong belief uh, in the self as independent entity. And strong value is placed on distinct individuals and you know, basically agency, that is source of action, is based on this assumption so that you use your goals and desires and values to organize your behavior. So even your interpersonal relationships are also premised on your preferences. For example, you may choose your boyfriend, girlfriend, or even your friends. And by the way, that, that whole notion was a little bit foreign when I came here. You know, I thought I was supposed to be a friend with everybody if those people are in the same lab or same class. That's not true <laughs> at Michigan anyway. Uh, so uh, well, one, way, uh, one way in which we tried to conceptualize this whole thing was to say that culture provides recipe 
so to speak, or tasks, or some script, or Carol called practices, which allow you to realize this or that value. So here, general value of independence, autonomy, something like this. And Western culture, over the history, many generations, prepared a whole bunch of tasks which are thought to accomplish each one of those things. So for example, you have to be independent. What does it mean? Well, that could be independence by economic me uh, meaning. Or you may have to make a choice. You have to choose your friends. Or you have to be unique. You have to be X and Y. There are some, well, we did some study. There, there are several distinct ways in which you, ca you can accomplish uh, this. Uh, uh, value of independence, in, at least in Western student population. And we called those different ways of accomplishing uh, some value, cultural tasks. Now, in Eastern civilization, well, what I mean by this is essentially Eastern part of Eurasian continent for some evolutionary and historical reasons. And there, interestingly, generally, there's much greater value is placed on some fundamental relatedness. You just cannot dissociate yourself from your group, from your life. You know, your group membership is very important. And of course, you have personal preferences and goals and so on. But those internal attributes are considered to be subordinate to relational concerns. So agency become we based. We call it a uh, conjoint agency. And just as in Western case, we conceptualize this whole thing in terms of cultural tasks. So uh, what we meant by this is uh, over many generations, many years, uh, there are, there's a set of tasks designed to achieve some interdependent values, maybe social harmony, maybe social coordination, maybe something else. Uh, uh, and some of the tasks include being similar, maybe standing in, working for the collective while making sacrifice on yourself, and so on. And now, well, I, I would say in during 1990s year, well, the decade of 2000, Really, lots of people worked on this kind of framework um, and trying to see if this might be true in some, in some verifiable way. Um, you know, you can always say, oh, look at that Japanese. Uh, he doesn't behave in that way. And you can look at me, of course. Uh, but the question is, uh, you know, of course, there's always individual difference. Is, there, is it really true to make those claims uh, in some general basis? And people came up with many different tasks. Well, somewhat egoistically, I'm emphasizing my own contribution, but that doesn't mean that other people didn't do anything. To, just to the contrary. Many people worked on it. So for example, uh, in one line of research, uh, we investigated uh, the basis of happiness, exactly when people report happiness. And uh, Americans are overwhelmingly achievement-based in the domain of happiness. Canadian, I don't have any data. Um, Slightly more sane, probably. I don't know. Uh, uh, Asians, Chinese, uh, Japanese, uh, Koreans, uh, much more social harmony based or so social connection based. How do I know? Well, we did free response study, daily diary study, and so on, and simply to show that correlate of happiness is very different across cultures. Now, we also investigated the domain of motivation. So one very strong evidence uh, from the United States, uh, from Western psychology, uh, is the power of choice. When you make a choice, you feel motivated. So which do you like? Oh, psychology, anthropology? Oh, you have to make a choice, right? Uh, this is very powerful. And in one study we did, we didn't find anything uh, among Japanese and also Japanese students at the UBC. Why is that? Uh, that's very interesting. And as it turned out, 
all the experimental paradigms used in Western cultural context is using private choice. You know, that's a wonderful experimental control, bringing subjects individually and have him or her seated in the empty room and then have him make a choice. Nobody's watching. And as it turned out, interdependent folks don't care the choice they make in social vacuum. And we manipulated social context to show that once social context being made available, agents show very strong motivation effect of choice. And by the way, interestingly, Americans appear to be put off uh, when social context is given. Uh, so that's, a, that's an interesting way in which individualism can show up. Now, more cognitive domain, lots of studies have been done on range of attention. So if you know what you're going to do, at least your culture tells you that you have to know what you want to do, your attention becomes more focused, right? Now, you are living in a culture where other people are very important. There are social duties and obligations. And then your attention may be trained in such a way that it's much broader in scope. And I just cannot go through many studies, but there's now fairly strong evidence indicating that there's very clear mean level cultural difference so that attention tend to be more holistic among people with Asian background. And by the way, uh, Asian background, that's uh, really Asian heritage. And all this is changing in the last last 10 years or 20 years probably in China. Uh, just China is amazing, changing so much. And I don't know exactly why, maybe extreme competitiveness, you know, at the very high level of achievement, or maybe one child policy, maybe some confluence between those two. Uh, but just, uh, you know, I mean, simply I, I know it because when we test, Asian students coming from China. Sometimes they are more American than Americans. Uh, I think that's fairly recent phenomenon in the last 10 years, 15 years. That, that effect didn't exist when I started out. So in any case, and one more cognitive step. Uh, Dick Nisbet, a colleague of mine, uh, proposed that um, independent individuals tend to be more analytic. You have to focus on one thing and you draw inference from it. So inference tend to be more linear, whereas more interdependent folks tend to be more holistic. And you know, maybe part of it is to achieve social harmony. You know, Lawrence, you're right. I'm also right. Well, maybe truth is, could be right in between. Uh, so Dick called it dialectic uh, thinking. Uh, and, and again, uh, evidence is pretty OK. Now, given all this, uh, well, if you are not satisfied uh, with all this, and you can uh, you begin asking the question, why is that? Uh, maybe that's uh, some kind of artifact, or maybe cultural stereotype influencing your behaviors, or maybe some kind of priming effect. Uh, uh, of a sort, well, you don't know what that is. Uh, I can explain in the question uh, Q&A. So where those cultural differences might have come from became a very, very uh, big deal. And uh, well, to understand this, I think we need to get back to history slash evolution, at least uh, up to uh, 50,000 years or so. I just don't have any time to go back to <laughs> you know, the long past that Carol invited us to go back. But about 50,000 years ago, uh, you know, just amazing thing happened. Anatomically, modern humans somehow began spreading uh, out of Africa. Who knows exactly what happened? Well, actually, anatomically modern humans, our ancestors, uh, direct ancestors, were nearly extinct back then, presumably because of the change of the climate. And however, at the same time, they must have achieved 
what we call culture or social coordination, theory of mind, a whole bunch of things which create very strong group presence. Presumably, all this enable them to venture into a whole uh, other part of the globe uh, just to survive. And well, the rest is history, uh, essentially. Uh, over the next uh, 4,000 years or so, um, I'm, so I'm sorry, 40,000 years or so, really uh, our ancestors spread all over uh, the globe. And uh, well, they are really primitive people who don't know anything. Well, that's not true. Well, yesterday over dinner, I talked about my wonderful trip to the south of France, Alaska, and you know several you know caves where paintings like this were have been preserved, and just amazing. Look at this. This is about. I would say uh, 25,000 years ago, and this is a little bit more recent, and this is very recent, and extremely symbolic, extremely symbolic and abstract, and I'm sure Shagar must have got his idea uh, from this. Uh, just amazing, uh, and you can see, uh, you know, uh, how much symbolic capabilities they had, how much differentiation of occupation they had. Well, this is a work of real professional as opposed to somebody like me uh, and all that. Now, very interestingly, about 10,000 years ago, all this culture disappeared. And again, it's mystery. Mystery. I mean, you know, some people say that they became sophisticated enough so that ex they exterminated all the animals. That's not quite true. You know, animals uh, have been abundant. And, but in any case, about 10,000 years ago, humans began sedentary form of existence. So initially, harding began to happen, the domesticating, domesticated capable uh, animals. Uh, some animals is just impossible. Uh, some other animals are easy to tame, and they can work for you, right? Uh, so those animals happen to be available in the region, and people are willing or capable of or knowing how to domesticate uh, those animals. And that happened around this area, that's uh, you know, eastern part of Turkey today, uh, just above uh, Fatal Crescent, and that's about uh, 10,000 uh, 10, years ago. And shortly afterward, uh, uh, you know, 10 or 20 crops began to be domesticated, uh, you know, just uh, providing the basis for uh, sedentary living and presumably, you know, preserving lots of uh, much important resource and source uh, of carry. And that's how human civilization, so-called, uh, began to unfold. Now, uh, what's really interesting about this region is that uh, there are several really prominent crops back then, but one of them that historically proved to be very important uh, was wheat. Uh, some varieties, some various, uh, you know, uh, uh, kinds of wheat, and uh, it's very resilient. Uh, and it requires a lot of lands. However, uh, the, the climate can be uh, quite uh, cold and can be dry. And as a consequence, uh, uh, essentially wheat spread across all over the Eurasian continent horizontally. That helps too. Uh, you know, basically, climate is very similar in horizontal line, and that's really part of the reason why uh, now you can enjoy some wonderful food, uh, beer, croissant, and all that in western part of the well. Come to Japan. Well, even Japanese have those things now uh, after globalization, but not until uh, 100 years ago. Now, there was an important exception, which was China. Basically, well, China didn't quite exist back then. Uh, eastern edge of the Eurasian continent, where the climate uh, was entirely different, uh, basically, extremely hot and humid. 
uh, it's getting worse uh, in the recent decades. Uh, however, even back then, uh, just the rainfall is massive and temperature was very high. And in fact, climate must be warmer uh, back then in upper part of contemporary China. And just very lucky for, uh, you know, human being, uh, rice was j just available uh, as a crop, viable crop uh, to cultivate. And rice cultivation started about uh, supposedly eight or 9,000 years. Uh, in this area, uh, uh, Yangtze River and the Yellow River, somewhere in between. Uh, that's what happened. Now, <coughs> let me skip this. Uh, one uh, really interesting thing about all this, so you might wonder what crops might have anything to do uh, with analysis of cu culture, but just on one day, uh, it occurred to us that, you know, look at those uh, pictures of a uh, paddy field for rice cultivation and just a wheat uh, field. It's very clear that very different things are happening. Wheat is relatively less laborious, less intensive in terms of labor and concentration. In comparison, rice is a different matter. Uh, it requires lots of water, uh, and also it's seasonal. Because you need water, you really need irrigation system. Uh, as it turned out, well, evidently, evidence exists that some systematic irrigation systems start once rice got domesticated every, every place. And this is extremely sophisticated thing, right? There's a slope, and you know, all the putty must be horizontal so as to keep the water, and the water go one by one to every one of those fields. And, well, you just can imagine what kind of social consequence uh, this might have. Uh, this is like you cannot drink milk in the middle of desert. Uh, you know, uh, just, it's a life or death. You know, very much like lactose tolerance uh, is really important if your neighbors or you yourself is keeping cows or sheep and so on so that your life is dependent on milk of some kind. In this case, water is your lifeline. And to, ha to have access to water, you really have to belong to the tribe or some social unit that's organized in the water allocation. So, of course, this is oversimplification. However, we hypothesize that maybe one interesting and potentially powerful source of cultural differentiation between individualism, which are not to be relatively dominant in western part of the Eurasian continent, and collectivism, or belief in interdependence, which is relatively more dominant in eastern part, might have something to do uh, with this. And how can we test this? And of course, you cannot go back uh, 10,000 years and test this kind of idea. So one, uh, you know, uh, next best thing we try to do was to look into this huge country, China. China is a huge country, and of course, China is not homogeneous. And China is very different in terms of historical level of allocation of agricultural field to rice as opposed to wheat. So we try to see if traditional wheat area and traditional rice area might be systematically different in terms of cognitive style and some other social dimensions like independence or interdependence. And here's one piece of data. Here, those are provinces in China which are different in terms of percent of cultivated land devoted to rice paddies. So more rice, field, rice areas are in that way. This is much more wheat. And size of the circle indicate the divorce rate, essentially, uh, contemporary. 
And uh, by the way, this, uh, 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 this rice versus wheat data is coming from in the last uh, 100 years or so. Okay. Now, fairly systematic relationship so that divorce rate tend to be higher in wheat region and divorce rate, of course, of what, what does divorce mean, right? That's a big question, but uh, one assumption we board into is that divorce is one indicator of individualism. Now, how about cognitive style? Uh, you might remember just a moment ago I said that uh, individualists tend to be more analytic using semantic categories, whereas more interdependent people tend to use more holistic uh, social inference rules. So that's what we try to test. So here's a glove, and subjects have to choose one or the other uh, as better fit uh, to, the, to the target stimulus. If you are analytic, you are supposed to be using semantic categories, and therefore, well, glove and scarf must go together. However, you are more relational, of course, you need a hand to use glove. Glove is for your hand. So uh, glove and hand, that's more relational uh, thinking style. And here, this is proportion of holistic relational categorization, uh, right? Uh, the extent of it. And again, there's well, weak but systematic uh, relationship uh, between those two. So more uh, rice regions tend to show stronger evidence of holistic and more relational thinking. Now, rice and wheat is the only thing. And how about harding? We have some evidence indicating that harding lends itself to more independent notion of the self or more analytic mode of thought. And one additional issue we have investigated is potential effects of voluntary settlement. Uh, so this obviously came from my own experience uh, in the United States. Uh, you know, eventually I began asking, well, what kind of Europeans came all the way <laughs> to the United States? Uh, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. Uh, somebody, some people chose to come here. Lots of people must have followed, uh, you know, those leaders and so on. However, there might be some systematic effect of voluntary settlement. After all, you have to choose where to go and what you are going to do, and all those things that you may have to do during the settlement might encourage uh, independent notion of the self. So in order to investigate this, we went back to Japan. Um, and well, the reason is uh, pretty straightforward. This northern island of Japan is very, very interesting in this context. Uh, it, you know, this was just a wilderness until 150 years ago. And uh, back then, Russia became a major threat in that region. And some people say that it continued to be. Uh, uh, and uh, around that time, the, this uh, samurai society was dissolved. So there are lots of uh, samurai warriors who needed a job. So the new government uh, did a you know, clever thing, essentially creating uh, you know, 10, 20 settlements uh, in Hokkaido. And then lots of peasants followed the suit so that Quite, quite large number of peasants from the main island moved to Hokkaido back then. That's when Hokkaido, Northern Island, became, well, I don't know. I mean, conservatives, cons conservative politicians may disagree. But that's when Hokkaido became the territory uh, of Japan. And we investigated whether there might be some systematic difference between Hokkaido and the rest of Japan in terms of independence and interdependence, because to the extent the settlement might encourage, does encourage uh, independence, Hokkaido people may show some mental characteristics which are in common with what you might see in American undergraduates or American people in general. Um, oh, by the way, 
uh, this is another weird thing in the field. You know, always I hear the criticism that we are testing undergraduates. So I took it very seriously, and we conducted very systematic research, randomly sampling residents in Ann Arbor and also Ypsilanti, that's a, a you know, working class uh, city right next to Ann Arbor. And that's a very expensive study. And by the way, we replicated uh, 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 cultural difference when we compared those forks with forks sampled in Tokyo in pretty much the same way. So I don't think this whole thing is limited to college undergraduate. However, when we try to publish this paper, no reputable journal took it because the finding is no more than replication. I mean, that, that's, I, I found it just entirely ridiculous. But anyway, so that's, uh, so still, the finding itself is still unpublished. So we, we did this Hokkaido study, and the finding was just uh, so interesting. Uh, ho pattern we found in Hokkaido was very similar to Americans. Sometimes this is true for Hokkaido folks who are born and raised in Hokkaido, or sometimes true only for those folks who are born in mainland and moved to Hokkaido. But overall, there's very clear evidence that there's a spirit of independence in Hokkaido, in this, uh, in, in this island of collectivism. Now here, one more little study we did uh, along the theme. This is a proportion of very strange, weird name given to babies in different states. We identified, well, essentially, that's a little ridiculous way of explaining uh, what is much less dramatic. We identified 10 or 20 most common names in each of the years we investigated. And then we counted the number of babies who were given the names which are not, I think. Yeah, that's right. Who, who are given those conventional names. And here, well, x-axis is the date of United uh, States statehood. So essentially, this is a major of uh, Western frontier. And what you see, again, is that there's, there's tremendous variation across different uh, states. However, there's fairly systematic relationship so that more frontier you go, the proportion of the most conventional names uh, goes down. And this is this what's true for male names and uh, female names. So summary so far, um, this is a very quick view uh, of uh, somebody's life, many people's lives. Uh, uh, you know, basically, uh, human evolution happened over you know 700,000 years, and I started out about 50,000 years ago. That's fairly recent. That's when humans spread across the entire globe. Now we focused on Eurasian continent, and because of ecological differences, presumably there's systematic differences in social institutions, uh, you know, practices, and supposedly religion and everything else, which gave rise to some systematic cultural difference which we witness uh, today uh, between eastern part of Eurasian continent and the western part and of course the western part spread all over the uh, globe. The United States is the most typical, Canada of course, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, those are the most typical places which you, you can find today. Uh, western. Uh, independent, you might call, culture. And most likely, there are many different factors which facilitated this historical slash evolutionary process. But I, uh, I highlighted those three uh, factors. Now, where should the field go uh, from this point? Uh, that was a question uh, you know, I asked myself. Uh, sort of, uh, 
you know, so once you get used to something, uh, you feel very secure, very comfortable, and it's like tenure. You can keep doing the same thing for your rest of life. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, you need that. However, I, I'm a little different. Uh, just, you know, east-west difference, fine. Uh, we did it. So where do we want to go? That's the kind of question we asked uh, about uh, 10 years ago. And ecology is one. So rice, wheat, and all that is one. Uh, consequence of that, and lots of people are now studying some ecological factors, temperature, climate, uh, social mobility, uh, and those kind of thing. But back then, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, I thought, well, one really interesting question uh, might lie, might, uh, could be found in neuroscience. Why is that? Well, the reason, which I didn't articulate back then, was that, well, what is human nature? Human nature, well, Carol again uh, said a wonderful thing, that is, uh, culture is naturalized. Uh, well, what that means is that human nature is not really stable thing. You know, human nature is not anything that you can find in Stone Age, uh, in some museum of Stone Age, you know, primitive men or women. But instead, maybe human nature lies in the fact that humans form themselves in some systematic way by creating social institutions, cultural practices, social relationships, and so on, so that they kind of condition their own nature so that they can survive within the niche which, are, which is so constructed. So here's a question I, I found very fascinating, and uh, that's, that's my rationale of using, what well, at least trying to use, many funding agencies refuse <laughs> to give me money. However, uh, this is the way I found this endeavor most fascinating. So this question, how, how is nature nurtured? So by nature, I mean very broadly, maybe some kind of a, you know, uh, 10,000 year uh, evolution history, as well as generational change, and of course, developmental change. Uh, that's really crucial. And so this raises some interesting question. Uh, so, uh, well, some interesting questions about the mechanisms of cultural influence. Okay, we know that culture influence uh, our mind and presumably brain as well. How does this cultural influence happen? Well, some biological anthropologists, uh, Rob Boyd, uh, Pete Richardson, and so on, they emphasize conformity. Oh, sure, conformity is important. Uh, and also mimicry is also very important, and pre presumably there's a genetic basis for mimicry for humans, as you can see in the effect of over-imitation. You imitate too much than you are supposed to uh, in human babies. Uh, but in addition to all this, uh, reinforcement is very important. And well, actually this morning, this uh, hedonic uh, uh, treadmill uh, is very interesting. And I don't know exactly how to conceptualize all this within the framework I'm going to present. And surely we can go back to it. But in very general level, we, we do respond to reinforcement. Reinforcement being money, being praise, being compliment, being just social approval, many different sorts, and maybe some reinforcement through more symbolic mean. Uh, it's, it's possible. So now, I think this has very important implication for neuroplasticity and change in the brain in some systematic way. Because here, culture, cultural meanings and cultural practices, possibly social institutions and so on, which are built up over the years, ever since your village started uh, rice cultivation, <laughs> okay? Uh, who knows, but that, that has a long history behind it. And 
this is the way, essentially, you know, reward contingencies. The reward contingencies are inscribed in cultures, practices, and the meanings, and so on. And from the very moment of conception, I would say, and surely very moment of childbirth, you know, organism, baby, actively work on this environment, initially actively reaching mom or, you know, caretaker initially, but this environment, you know, uh, expand very rapidly, and that environment give you a feedback. And this is one way to conceptualize human development, and even imitation or conformity may not last long unless it comes with some kind of reinforcement. Now, why is this interesting? This is where Donald Hebb uh, can come in. So essentially, I would argue that once some response is reinforced, the response is reinforced, but also all the brain circuitries which are recruited to produce the response may well be also reinforced, strengthened. So, you know, different neurons fire together, they get wired together, that's what Donald Hebb said. And that's how he tried to conceptualize structural change in the brain. And some basic principle like this might be or could be in operation to produce some very plastic change in the brain. Now, this is very consistent uh, with the literature that, again, Carol mentioned uh, on neuroplasticity. Uh, but, uh, but basically, this literature shows that repeated engagement in various different tasks can result in enlargement of relevant brain regions. And one caveat, probably this statement depends on exactly when in the course of development you test Probably when you are testing somebody in puberty age, the effect can go in the opposite way because uh, the effect of practice may involve some cutting out of some noise as opposed to elaborating on uh, some neural structure. So a lot of this needs to be worked out, but at least in adult, I think evidence is pretty good that once you try working on some tasks, brain regions which are used to perform the task become bigger. How do we know? Initial evidence came from animal study like this, effects of enriched as opposed to impoverished environment. Rats allow to engage in this extremely wonderful Disneyland-like environment and show evidence of neural growth, okay? Now, in the last 20 years or so, there are lots of studies on abacus, juggling, London cab driving. Unfortunate that you cannot do this anymore because of this navigation system. And, and of course, uh, yoga and meditation practices. And all those things can, can produce some systematic change uh, in the brain volume, and most likely a whole bunch of other structural elements like connectivity or, uh, I forgot, some fancy terms uh, that I'm forced to learn these days. Just the frontier of neuroscience is just moving so rapidly. So almost uh, every year new techniques show up to characterize different structural aspects. But now, if this is the case, how about the culture? You know, uh, culture, uh, I told you, is a set of tasks which every person born into that culture may be encouraged to carry out. You know, if you are American, you may be encouraged to work out and carry out independent tasks. Probably you don't have to do everything, but probably you have to do one or two just to show that you are a decent individual. Uh, that may be true uh, for our Japanese as well. And does this have any systematic effect on the brain? So th that's the next question we wanted to address. Now, independence involves different tasks, 
tasks of self-promotion, self-actualization, uh, tasks to be free and to become autonomous, and so on. And well, it seemed to us that many of those tasks, although very variable when you take each of them separately, required some recruitment of what you might call prefrontal functions. Prefrontal functions by which I mean base va value-based judgment, what do you like, what do you want, strategizing and forming your own preferences, developing very clear self-concept and decide what you really want, you know, uh, is he your guy or not? You really have to have a clear image of yourself before making this judgment. Now, prefrontal cortex is here. Uh, and as I mentioned to you, evidence is emerging that two regions appear to be influenced. Well, I say this causal term with some caution. Uh, much of the evidence is correlational. But evidence is pretty interesting and intriguing. OFC, that's right above your eyeballs, and MPFC, that's uh, you know here right in the middle uh, of your brain. Now, if you look at interdependent tasks, self-sacrifice, obligation and duty, social harmony, maybe there are some more. Well, it it strikes to me that. These tasks, at least many of them, seem to involve some downregulation, inhibition of the self-regulatory capacities. You know, what's the best way to do something nice to you? You know, best for me to downregulate what I want. That downregulation of some prefrontal function. Strategizing, well, you do too much of strategizing by yourself, you may be kicked out from your group. You are too egocentric. Uh, and again, uh, you know, going along with a group might require some suppression, inhibition, downregulation of prefrontal cortex. So that's a very vague general idea we started with. And we wanted to see if there might be any merit in this kind of conjecture. So here's a study we did uh, several years ago. We recruited real adults, in this case, in Kyoto, about 130 or 40 uh, Kyoto citizens, both males and female. And we use standard method to measure the volume of gray matter in different regions of the brain. At the same time, we ask them to fill out a questionnaire designed to assess independent and interdependent self-construal. So independence may be like, you know, I, I always express my opinions even when others are disagreeing with me. Uh, interdependence could be my happiness depends on happiness of other people around me. Uh, those uh, different scales, items. And what we did was to determine which part of the brain, brain volume, might be predicted by the response to those questionnaires. Of course, brain is complicated. There are many neurons, many regions. So you really have to do serious control, statistical safeguarding. And after all this is done, one region that survived was here. Uh, by the way, we use the extremely stringent criteria in this case, and we believe that this is really real. And you know, you, you are like me. You say, "Oh, this is such tiny. Oh, well, who cares?" No, that's not true. Uh, th these are tiny, but these are really center uh, of gravity. Uh, that shows real effects, and effects obviously spread. Uh, across uh, different nearby regions. What you find is that there's a systematic relationship between interdependence and volume here. 
so that interdependent people tend to show this volume. On this side, uh, this is uh, right and this is left. Oh, by the way, this is OFC. This is the view of the brain. If you cut here, cut the brain here and look it up. Uh, eyes are here, right? And this is right above your eyeballs. So that's orbitofrontal cortex. And there are many functions uh, attributed to this. One is value-based judgment. Another is forming of preferences. So for example, OFC lesion patients can no longer form consistent preferences. That is, um, you know, if you like spaghetti over um, what, uh, pasta salad, and you like pasta salad over something, uh, say potato soup, you are supposed to love spaghetti over potato soup. Uh, just this transitivity will be violated once uh, this region uh, is uh, cut out. Now, this is interesting and just a fast piece of data. Uh, now, just get back to this um, assumption that Asians are more interdependent. Now, you combine uh, this assumption with this data you might expect that there might be some systematic cross-cultural difference in prefrontal brain volume, correct? That seems like a racist uh, claim, but it's not, so don't worry. Uh, I'll get back to it, and eventually I'll make a point that probably this is based on, this, is, this reflect the effects of experience, not really genetic ancestry. But in the meantime, prediction is fairly clear, right? Somewhere in prefrontal region, there might be some systematic cross-cultural difference. And that data that can address this kind of prediction did exist. Um, here's a Denise Park, a friend of mine. Uh, she was at Michigan some time ago, and she went on, now she's in Texas. And she did a very systematic uh, brain volume research, both in Singapore, and examining Han Chinese, by the way, and white Americans, European Americans, uh, in Urbana Champaign, in Illinois. And they found fairly diverse areas where they, can, they could find, identify a brain volume difference. So yellow means that those are the areas where Americans, European Americans show bigger uh, volume. Well, data is a little bit strange because total brain volume is entirely controlled. So it's very strange that there's nowhere where Asians, Singaporeans show bigger volume. So the only way I can interpret this strange finding is that whatever cultural difference exists such that Asians show greater volume may tend to be more diffused so that they do not clear the criterion in this particular research. But I can get back to it later. Uh, one thing that's very interesting, this is a central center cut, so to speak. No, I'm sorry. Oh, this is lateral view, and this is center view. This is right hemisphere. This is right, this is left. And this is, uh, this is OFC here. Here's OFC too. And here, MPFC, very strong effects. Very strong effects. Uh, now, we also, well, who knows? This is uh, just a single cross-cultural research. So recently, we tried to replicate this, and we recruited uh, 66 Asian-born Asians uh, and 66 European Americans, all students at the University of Michigan, right-handed, majority women, and so on. And simply, we tried to see if this ethnic slash cultural difference might duplicate, and here's what we got. Unlike Denise Park et al. research, we found some regions that show evidence of greater volume among, among agents. That's fine. Now, 
Here, important finding is that those are the regions that are clearly bigger, quote unquote, among uh, European Americans than among uh, Asians. Here, this is uh, MPFC. Uh, this is frontal view. This is MPFC. Uh, here, MPFC spread to lateral side. This is OFC. This is clearly OFC, huge region. Uh, all this uh, shows uh, very strong evidence for cultural difference, such that volume is greater uh, for European Americans as compared to Amer Asians. Here, Asians show some interesting effects. Uh, I believe that this is Chinese ideograph effect, probably. There's some evidence indicating that uh, ideograph use uh, may influence this region. Uh, and this is fairly close to, well, I wouldn't speculate too much, uh, TPJ. And that might have something to do with uh, perspective taking and so on. But as it stands, none of this was found in Singaporean research. So I would just leave it at that. Uh, two findings which seem to replicate very well is here, MPFC and OFC. Uh, both regions are greater in volume among Americans of European descent as compared to Asian-born Asians in Michigan as well as Chinese descent Singaporeans in Singapore. Uh, those are exceptions. Well, I would say everybody in between might show some similar effect. Now, by the way, uh, this is a replication of our original finding, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, you know, now that replication become a big deal, uh, so every time you collect some additional data, uh, you know, you, you may have to take a chance of embarrassment, but they, uh, you know, possibly. So I'm very happy to report that more interdependent uh, people are, uh, more interdependent, they, their OFC volume tend to be smaller, and that appears to be true uh, for uh, the both uh, cultural group. All right. So now, how can we begin explaining uh, brain differences? So today, uh, in this lecture, well, let me try to finish within 10 minutes. Uh, ecology is very important, and out of which uh, cultural norms and beliefs emerge over the course of about 10,000 years ago. There's very systematic influence on mentality, which may well uh, come with some structural variation as well. And now one, one really missing link uh, is genes. Uh, genetic change or maybe epigenetic processes and Michael Meany and some other people uh, will be coming here to give you far greater information about this. But here today, I'd like to discuss this gene stuff just a little bit, just to give you, well, because that gave us a way to address this very interesting and thorny issue of causality. So, here, there's a systematic difference between Asians and European Americans. And uh, we believe that it's because of cultural experience. Is that really true? Uh, it's very hard to tell. And in our current research, um, we try to address the thorny issue by using genes, genes as a means to differentiate between two hypotheses. Uh, this is what I mean. Well, Carol already discussed uh, this idea of plasticity allele. Uh, there are some select genes whose allelic variants are associated with plasticity or sensitivity to environmental influence. So for example, if you are carrying, was it AA? of serotonin receptor gene, you are more likely to be influenced by your environment. 
presumably including cultural environment. So if this effect, you know, brain volume difference between two cultural groups is due to cultural experience, this cultural difference ought to be larger for those folks who carry plasticity audio. Make sense? Now, what kind of plasticity audio would you like to look into? Carol looked into a serotonin system. Now, in the case of cultural learning, there's a lot of reason to look into dopamine system. Dopamine system because you know, you really have to respond and process reward signals. Not only that, just you cannot be sensitive because it requires lots of intellectual work to summarize a whole bunch of previous experience. You know, whether this behavior works. Oh, yeah, it worked yesterday. How about two or three days ago? No, it didn't. Well, you really have to you know, summarize this entire experience to get some abstract representations about cultural rules, right? So it's not just reward sensitivity. Lots of things which are going on in executive systems to enhance this ability to process reward signals. And there's a lot of reason to believe that dopamine is very important. Uh, because dopamine is involved in reward processing regions and also prefrontal region in general. And here, this is a, a very quick uh, summary of what dopamine does. Uh, dopamine, uh, now there's a lots of neuroscience evidence indicating that dopamine is crucially important in the processing of reward signal, uh, particularly anticipated reward. That's interesting, anticipated reward. And, and the rest is a little bit of social science -y speculation. The point is that lots of motivation comes from anticipated rewards in our case. You know, you are motivated to write a paper for a journal. Well, the only thing you can count on is that paper could be published someday. Well, I'm sorry, that may not happen tomorrow. Uh, you really have to work hard. Uh, how about your job? Education, speaking of education. Education is a prototypical example of delayed reward. You know, having no payoff at all for 10, 20 years in the hope that you can get it sometimes. You know, that's, that's Interesting. So education career, next JPSB, that's the journal in our field. Uh, redemption, salvation, reincarnation, those are all uh, religious ideas. And here, Robert Sapolsky, uh, who's saying that there's no monkey out there willing to live press because it, St. Peter is on the line. So here, there's a lot of reason to speculate that dopamine may be very central in human civilization. Uh, now, here's the dopamine system. Uh, here's the synapse. Lots of things are involved. Here, you know, neurotransmitter dopamine must be crafted, produced, and transmitter send a signal. Signal needs to be received, and then dopamine needs to be recycled, and so on. And one particular gene proved to be very important in regulating this particular receptor, dopamine D4 receptor. And that gene is called DRD4, dopamine D4 receptor gene. And this is extremely interesting. I think I'm using up too much time. But I think this detail is both interesting and very important. First of all, uh, this gene has an extremely peculiar structure. In one portion of the gene, there's a polymorphic region that has extremely strange structure. So that polymorphism is defined by repetition of 48 alphabet, right? And this 48 alphabet are sometimes repeated only once, sometimes twice, all the way up to 11 times. 
that's extremely unusual. And most common variants are two, four, two repeat, seven repeat, and two repeat. And you can carry out lab study to show that which alleles are more effective in receiving, in this case, in the processing of dopamine. And as it turned out, seven repeat and two repeat are more effective than four repeat. And here's the interesting part. Now you can, you can do this kind of estimation, exactly when those gene variants might have been incorporated into the human genome. This really stunned me. So seven repeat appears to have happened given this available evidence based on this whole gene scan data, which you can find in London somewhere, right? Now everybody's computer. About 50,000 years ago. How about two repeat? About 20,000 years ago. So there might be something going on in the co-evolution of this particular gene and culture, whatever culture is. And finally, this information. This seven repeat and two repeat have been linked to enhanced processing of reward signal. Well, that's new data, by the way. I can't talk about it, but uh, that's new data, not published. And finally, a whole bunch of developmental studies have demonstrated that those two alleles function as plasticity allele. So now, given all this set of facts, we wondered if seven repeat, two repeat allele of DRD4 might modulate uh, cultural influences. So here's a, well, let me skip this. I can get back to it. So here's the data. Uh, remember, we tested OFC and MPFC, and Asians are less, and Caucasians are more in terms of volume. Question is whether this cultural difference may be modulated by, moderated by DRD4. The idea is that if the cultural difference in brain volume is due to cultural experience, this effect ought to be more pronounced for people who carry seven repeat or two repeat of DRD4. And here's a summary of it. Uh, this is OFC and non-carriers, carriers, and Asian folks, European, Caucasians, and there's very clear cultural difference such that OFC is bigger uh, greater in volume among Caucasian Americans, but this effect is clearly more pronounced uh, among seven or two repeat carriers. Now, there are a few additional data that may be very interesting. Now, we tested Asian-born Asians in the United States, in Michigan, so they vary uh, in the amount of experience in the United States. So that's interesting, you know, more years you spend in Ann Arbor, Michigan, do you show any evidence of expansion of OFC? Uh, so we wanted to see if anything like this might happen. And here's data. Interestingly, carrier show statistically significant increase of OFC volume as a function of number of years in the United States. There was no such effects among non-carriers. So this seems consistent, at least, uh, with the idea that more experience you have, your OFC volume can increase, especially if you are responsive to environmental influences. There's an important caveat, caveat being that all those folks was about 20 or 21 years old. So, uh, these numbers are entirely confounded with exactly when they came to the United States. So uh, that's unclear, makes sense. You know, well, when you came to the U.S. before high school, you may be more influenced. That's entirely possible. Uh, and another possibility is that OFC is so important in cultural learning, 
so that same effect could happen if we can recruit enough Americans who dare to go to China for an extended period of time. So we cannot test that. Uh, there are very few people. Can I finish all this? OK. Uh, so let me conclude. Now, culture. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I always try to do something without thinking too much about what I'm studying in the hope that you can get better understanding of what you have studied uh, over the years. So uh, now, given all the things we did, I am happy to define culture as a loosely organized complex of values, beliefs, and practices. And, uh, and I think culture is a significant shaper of agency. You know, how you behave, how you act, how you organize your behavior, as well as cognitive, emotional, motivational processes that constitute the self. Now, East and the West, um, well, again, uh, those are extremely loosely organized, but uh, loose doesn't mean unreal. Uh, I think that's real. Uh, and that has a, a long history behind it, to the extent that 10,000 years is long enough. And ecology, geography play a major role in forming this cultural difference. And, and now we have some initial neural evidence indicating that cultural influence can go really deep. Now, why is this important? I think, um, you know, uh, if you are an animal psychologist, you can study rats in the hope that you can learn something about the animal in general. And at least in my mind, uh, Asia, Europe, or East and the West, that's very specified, specific case, and that's very unique and idiosyncratic, but hopefully that provides some interesting model case that can be used to shed light on more general question. So, well, of course, uh, this whole research doesn't preclude any additional studies uh, to be done on other cultural, religious, ethnic traditions, which are very important, but hopefully this provide some anchor or some conceptual source of conceptual uh, ideas uh, for the future work. So anyway, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So. <laughs> Questions? Well, Asia, Asia, Caucasian, that's based on demographic questionnaire. We had fairly elaborate questionnaire about uh, ethnic heritage of parents and grandparents and themselves, where they are born. And so basically, uh, essentially, uh, folks who are born in Asia with Asian parents are classified as Asians. And the same applies to Caucasians, basically European heritage. And genes, we got saliva and just genotype. Uh, Who have Asian uh, origins that may not be that may, they may not be known by the family or they may, I mean, I Oh, I see. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't say it. Uh, we excluded the Asian Americans. Uh, basically, we created a huge subject pool out of which we recruited about what uh, 160 or so subjects, 30 or so subjects. So. We recruited subjects on the basis of demographic information and also genotype information. So genotype. So you are categorizing people by their genotype, not just by the demographic. Oh, yeah, carrier or like non-carrier. I mean, that's fairly straightforward as long as, yeah. who they themselves, they believe that they are 100% European, that that may be wrong. They could be 
Uh, they could have Asian well, we actually, that's interesting. We did an ancestry analysis, yeah. like a tr for 25 me or 23 me, that kind of thing. And when we did it, uh, simply Europeans are here, Asians are here, no overlap, essentially. Uh, basically, what we did was to pick up ethnicity markers, about 200 of them to see uh, if we can classify those subjects into different groups and let the computer do the rest of the work. And our subjects are classified into two non-overlapping groups. So that, that's you know, gen genotype-based classification, which entirely get confounded with subjective report in our case. Now, this may not apply if you include <laughs> You know, uh, Asian Americans, for example, or you know, multi-ethnicity uh, groups, which are increasingly common in many parts of Canada and the United States. But here, we simply didn't do it. We excluded those people. Yeah, for this purpose. Well, this doesn't mean that that's not important. That's important. Establish the categories whether you were looking at the um, ancestry, the genetic ancestry, not only the historical and cultural ancestry. Well, I mean, we didn't do any historical analysis. Uh, we simply used demographic information, right? So you know where you are born, right? And where your parents are coming from, where your grandparents were. Those are the kind of questions we asked. And we determined the group of people who are born in Asia with Asian parents. Yeah, I understood that, but uh, if I could like, finish my question. Um, you are looking into, when you're categorizing your participants, you're looking into demographics. Yeah. But then you look into genetics. That's why my, I don't understand how you create your groups based on one set of categories that are demographic, and then you look into something that is genetic. Why don't you look at the genetic composition when you draw your groups? Oh, uh, I, well, that's uh, part of the thing. Uh, so basically, demographic information that carries um, you know, kind of cultural heritage. That's the assumption. So you are born in, say, Caucasian heritage, you are socialized in some way, presumably, reflecting, you know, kind of independent cultural tasks. Asian case, uh, the other way, interdependent. So that's a kind of proxy for kind of cultural information you may be, in, you may be exposed. Now, the whole idea is that effect of this exposure to culture may be magnified by some genetic potential, some genotype that intensifies or make more effective the processing of reward information. If I can, I, I want to intervene because this is a very important issue. The, the category Asian in this study is not a racial category. It's a cultural category. You can construct a racial category. Well, racial race is a race is a you know social construction clearly. So this can be race, of course. I mean, there's clearly hundreds and hundreds of ethnic markers in genes, you know, reflecting this differentiation of different groups. So you can identify some alleles, maybe two hundred of them, and then you know, for hundred percent certainty, you can classify somebody being Asian or being Caucasian. And in this case, this classification, which we didn't use, but we did afterward, uh, just to see, you know, it, it's potentially interesting, right? Uh, lots of people are saying that they are Asian, but some Asians are more Asian in terms of this gene. And uh, might there be any effects of this? We explored this. A short answer to it is there's none. There's no effect of this genetic ancestry. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you are right. I mean, in this case, genetic classification and demographic information classification are entirely confounded. So, you know, that's part of the reason that motivated this research, right? 
So brain volume is different, and that could be because of this genetic ancestry. You know, maybe Asians are carrying some genes which give rise to smaller prefrontal cortex, or Caucasians are carrying some genotypes, you know, that may have different effects. And uh, as it turned out, it's very hard to exclude this kind of possibility without doing some systematic training study, maybe intervention study. In short of doing it, what we try to do was to get some clue to the thorny question by identifying genetic variants which are known to make you more sensitive to environmental influences. Okay, so there's a lot of reason to combine gene and the culture. After all, this is gene by culture interaction. I hope this makes sense. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so this isn't really as pertinent to the presentation, but um, I was curious, uh, in the paper Culture, Mind, and the Brain, um, I understand the argument um, for ingraining a culture and why this process needed necessarily rely on cognitive mediation. Um, but I was curious, from your perspective, um, does cognitive mediation still occur in some cases, or is it kind of um, broadly replaced by embodiment? or something else is for different experiences? You know, that's a very interesting question. Um, well, I, I'm sure cognition is very important. Uh, and before, well, I used to be very much like Carol. Uh, you know, whenever I see any scale, I thought that's garbage. Uh, because uh, none of them worked for me for a long time. What's really interesting in neuroscience work is that neural measures correlate so well with self-report measure. So my whole attitude to your question has changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, and I, I have to conclude that those self-report measures carry some real information under some conditions, okay? So clearly that's cognitive mediation cognitive mediation. And to me, really interesting question is exactly when and under what circumstances this evidence for this cognitive mediation might happen. And to be honest, you know, we don't know. And sometimes, you know, cognition may be secondary, if not involved at all. But some other times, cognition ought to have some major effects. Okay. Yeah. A couple more yeah. questions before we take a break, and then and, and, uh, Professor Kizia will be back, so we'll be able to keep going. But, yeah. I, I was wondering, like, for those studies that compared the Asian born Asians and the European Americans, uh, I, I, I think I maybe not understood why, um, why not Asian Americans were used. So this could potentially help disentangle. Um, what is genetic effect and what is, what is cultural effect, uh, or maybe to extent um, the variance explained by, like, so if you see like difference in brain volume, how much of it can be explained by American culture or by Asian ancestry? Yeah, well, you know, surely I agree. I agree. Uh, you know, this is not cheap study. That's the short answer. Uh, you need lots of resource, and uh, you know, you need lots of money, uh, essentially. And I I'm not millionaire or billionaire by any means. So studying Asian Americans would be very interesting, and to me, even more interesting could be, you know, uh, Caucasian Americans who go to Asian countries and spend some extensive period of time. Uh, and I wish I could, you know, take note of each individual's life in detail so that we can get uh, some better demographic, social, ecological information uh, above and beyond any, uh, you know, two or three item demographic uh, scales or questions. 
So all this is on the horizon, and I think uh, some interesting things are going on in Montreal. Uh, people are now using wearables to you know, identify where people are, and you can use uh, demo demographic information to identify where supermarkets are, where Whole Foods are, where you know some uh, working class supermarkets are, and so on. And you know this kind of information may enable you to uh, pin down uh, more specifically exactly what might be going on. So clearly, this is very crude initial attempt, and the only reason why we tested Asian Americans was to get as big effect as possible. Uh, we started this research when we quite didn't know that some Asian born Asians are not really Asian in stereotypic way. That is, you know, some Chinese folks are extremely individualistic for some reason, uh, which escaped my mind. Uh, so anyway, you, you're right. I mean, uh, somebody needs to do it. I want to do it, but you, you know, you have to find a way to fund the research. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, yeah, um, this is somewhat uh, virtually related, I guess. Uh, but uh, both Carol and you mentioned this thing about her memory, and then also the taxi drivers. And, this idea that certain cognitive tasks, um, like, like having to memorize things during oral culture, when we have oral cultures, uh, or we, when uh, taxi drivers have to memorize, you know, spatial maps in their brain, um, before we have technologies to offload a lot of these cognitive tasks. And it seems like, right, even if you look at um, about 40,000 years ago, humans had bigger brains because it was much more, we had to retain a lot more information. Now we can offload a lot of that to these cultural tools. And so we're kind of engaging with self-domestication where our brains tend to become smaller. It doesn't mean we're less smarter, but we can offload a lot of these tasks and tools, uh, tasks and to, to these tools. And so do you think at some point um, that's going to um, have implications for um, the cultural tasks that are making a difference in brain volume, and and there would be di harder to detect the different cultural differences in brain volume as we sort of offload more and more of our cognitive tasks into, onto these technologies and cultural tools. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, Yeah, well, humans are extremely creative. So w once new technologies come in, uh, they might uh, offload or you know just outsource some uh, capabilities uh, to technologies, like uh, you know uh, use your calendar to your can secretary or <laughs> uh, to your iPhone or so on. But always humans find a way to keep them busy too. Yeah, so, so for example, spatial navigation. Uh, in the case of driving a car, you don't have to use it. But maybe, uh, you know, now that in the postmodern world where existential crisis become really serious, you know, basically, you don't know what you're doing. You know, you don't have to do anything. And then you have to orient yourself in some space, you know, space of maybe meaning or something like this. You know, maybe volunteer work or social justice or, you know, critical psychiatry or uh, some, well, of course, cultural neuroscience, right? Some moral or if not moral value dimensions in which you can, uh, you know, uh, locate yourself. That's as spatial as anything else. And so that something like this could be a new task uh, postmodern individuals may have to engage in uh, to show some effects. Well, it's possible. Most of the people 
lose real estate somewhere in the brain, maybe hippocampi, uh, but some people who you know have existential endeavor like this may manage to keep uh, real estate in hippocampus. That's entirely possible. I think uh, you know those are the kind of questions that you can begin to ask. So I think you can keep you yourself busy. <laughs>